morning. This is the May 30th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek. This meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please sit in the back three rows. It will be posted on the internet. Before we get going, I want to welcome our two new board members, Dale and Kathleen, and uh, just remind you to keep your microphone fingers ready. Roll call, please. Kelso. Here. Birdsall. Here. Coonan. Neff? Here. Adams? Here. Anderson? Here. Brown? Here. Harrington? Here. Stumpfell? Here. O'Keefe? Here. Thank you. Welcome. You've all seen the uh, minutes. Are there any corrections or changes? Seeing none, those are approved. Update from Kevin. Are you, yes, from Walnut Creek. Thank you. Kevin Wilk. I'm here. Good morning, board, and congratulations to the two new board members as well. I don't know if we've met yet. Uh, I'm Kevin Wilk with the Walnut Creek City Council, and I'm your liaison to the city. Uh, so a couple of updates I wanted to be able to share with you, and I also have an answer to a question that I was asked last month by one of the board members about what Walnut Creek is doing with regards to the um, impact on the nearby roads to the 680 on-ramp and off-ramp that Caltrans is now doing for the next 18 months to two years. Uh, we asked about this last, about two weeks ago during an update at City Council. Um, there is a lot of coordination and communication between city staff with the Transportation Department and with Caltrans. Doesn't mean that there's going to be no impact, but it's going to be reduced as much as possible. The biggest impact is actually not going to be to the traffic on the streets, but to the noise to the surrounding neighborhood. And they're doing the best they can to help keep that down as well. And there's a lot of different things they'll be putting in place if it's louder than they expect it to be. They will not be doing any construction at night that will impact that, uh, but if they find that they do need to as it gets closer, um, they previously had put people up in hotel rooms that were next to it. Uh, we'll see, hopefully it doesn't get to that, but uh, I just want to get back with that answer. Uh, you may have heard about uh, Senate Bill 50 up in the state legislature that is put off until next year. Uh, myself, as well as the mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, went up to Sacramento a few weeks ago to take an official opposition to Senate Bill 50, which was about the housing impact the Senate is putting on uh, all cities within the state. Uh, essentially, what they were doing was taking away local governance and the ability to be able to set local ordinances for what we would like in our own approved zones. Uh, basically, what they'd be doing is putting as much uh, housing near transit as they could allow and take away some of the, whether it's height limits or density, um, the density allowances, parking uh, allowances, as well as even eliminating single family home zones. This was delayed uh, by one of the state senators in Southern California, and so this will not be taken up at least for another year. But as, uh, as a local city, and uh, all cities in the state were pretty much opposed to this because it takes away the ability for us to be able to really know what's going on with our own cities and we feel that we have the most knowledge of what our cities can take. So just an update on that one. Uh, we've got four priorities for the city as I mentioned, I've mentioned previously. We've got fiscal sustainability, economic development, infrastructure, and the Climate Action Plan. And with the Climate Action Plan as one of our priorities, uh, we want to talk about shared mobility, and that came to us a couple of weeks ago. The shared mobility program is the bike and scooter sharing plan that we've talked about before, and those are the lime green bike, the lime bikes, those are the green bikes you saw around town probably over the last year. Well, lime bikes and several other of these shared mobility programs have decided they're going with scooters that the bikes haven't uh, had the impact that they've wanted to. So the electric scooters seem to be a lot better in taking cars off the street because business people feel more comfortable uh, without riding a bike in their suits and, uh, and on their way to work. So we, have, we are looking into that for Walnut Creek. It's something that we are hoping to move forward with if we find the right partner. This has been successful in Memphis, Detroit, Denver, and several other cities around the country. But we also want to make sure that our local ordinances are able to handle the impact of electric scooters on the streets. Um, you'll hear more about that as the time comes, but I wanted to give you an update on that. And it's one of the reasons that we haven't seen the bikes around town like we did about even up to six months ago. Uh, we also uh, voted on increasing our CalPERS contribution for the city. And if you've been following the pension um, 
the, the pension crisis really in California, CalPERS is severely underfunded up and down the state. And this is due to the investments that they have made over the course of the last 20 years and the Great Recession that occurred about uh, 12 years ago. Walnut Creek's in pretty good shape, much better than most of the cities in California. So that's really good news. Uh, we've put $25 million into a irrevocable trust fund that will be paying that off over the next 20 years, along with some of the contributions that we normally make for the city. Uh, Walnut Creek's in a very good position, especially compared to some of our nearby neighbors. But we did vote to make that extra contribution now, and you'll be hearing more about that when you get the nutshell every quarter. It'll talk about some of the economic issues that are coming up. That'll be one of the big ones. And I last wanted to mention something that I'm proud about, and that is that at our last meeting, we voted to raise the rainbow flag in Walnut Creek officially in recognizing Pride Month for the month of June. Um, this is something that we're seeing in other cities around the Bay Area now. Um, several cities have also decided to take a proclamation or resolution and officially recognize this. We'll be raising the flag starting tomorrow at 4 p.m. in front of City Hall, and it will fly for the month of June. And uh, you'll probably be seeing more about that on the news and in media as well. And I'm here to answer any questions if you have. Questions, Carl. Yes, last week, uh, last month, you talked about closures of Civic Drive. I, is Civic is actually a significant arterial in downtown Walnut Creek. Will it be permanently limiting the number of lanes in that section between California and Locust? Uh, there has been, uh, they're doing some reconstruction there. It will not be permanently closed. It's just some temporary reconstruction. There's a detour around there now. You're talking about that one block that's right next to Target. And so that should, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, all of the construction will be completed and that'll be open again. No, I'm talking about the, the Lesher Center you were talking about... Oh, you're talking about... Okay, so you're talking about the Lesher Center um, reducing the lanes there for the construction that happens in the plaza that'll be occurring later this fall. Okay, the, but it's a temporary restriction. A absolutely. Well, actually, so I shouldn't even say it's a restriction. What we're doing are bulb outs around the corner of where the Lesher Center is on Locust and Civic. And so it'll uh, allow for more drop-offs or pickups and it will just be a larger plaza, but the lanes themselves will still be there. So there may be a temporary restriction in just being able to build out the plaza, but you'll have the full lanes afterwards. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions. Um, first, on the, the scooters, are those allowed to go on the sidewalk or are they restricted just to the street? They're restricted to the street. And so my question was, are we going to be able to ensure that there's the safety, not just of the people that are on the scooters, but of pedestrians and, um, and cars as well. And, but the, the ordinance is for them to be on the streets, where bikes go. So a bike can't go on the sidewalk. We see them on sidewalks, but they shouldn't be on sidewalks. Scooters will also have to be in the streets. Okay, thanks. And then the other, uh, I guess it's a question and a suggestion. The nutshell, is that available electronically? It is. So do people have the option of not getting it mailed to them? That's a good question. Seems I think, like it'd be good to sign, uh, let people sign up and save yeah, all that mailing and stuff. Let, let me let me check on that. I believe it's just a drop that goes to every single front door in Walnut Creek. Uh, but let me check to see if there's an opt-out method okay. as well. I haven't been asked that question before. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And now, Mary, the Treasurer's Report. Good morning, everyone. Today's Treasurer's Report summarizes April's GRF GRF financial results for both the operating budget and the GRF trust estate fund. So as always, I'll also provide the year-to-date data. For the month of April, the GRF operating budget had a budget deficit of $41,000. Revenues were $34,000 under budget, and expenses were $7,000 over budget. The revenue and expense variances are detailed in item five of today's board package. They're also in uh, yesterday's Rossmore News. Cumulative for the first four months of the year, the operating budget has a small surplus of $24,000. Revenues are $151,000 below budget, and expenses are $175,000 below budget. 
Now let's move to the membership transfer fees as part of the trust estate fund. The revenue from membership transfer fees picked up in April and were more than those in April of 2018. 53 fees were collected, generating $477,000. That compares to 43 fees collected in April 2018, which generated $387,000. So uh, those of us who follow this on the Finance Committee are happy to see that our revenue has gone up in this area. Cumulative for the first four months of the year, 139 membership transfer fees have been collected, generating $1,251,000. That compares to 159 fees for the same period in 2018, which generated $1,431,000. So currently, the 2019 membership revenue is $180,000 less than it was for the same period last year. And we hope to see that gap narrow as we um, get further into 2019. The total trust fund expenditures in April were $230,000 and included $14,000 for design of the gateway workshops, the renovation project there, and $28,000 for machinery and equipment, and $179,000 for debt service on the three GRF loans. The month-end cash balance for the fund is $3,612,000. Any questions from the board? Nope. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Mary. Uh, Tim, the CEO's report. Good morning, board members, residents, and staff. The, um, a couple of months ago, the board authorized a consultant to update Golden Rain Foundation's emergency operations plan. And um, the purpose of, for doing that was to um, identify how Golden Rain's facilities uh, personnel resources could be utilized in, in the event that the civil authorities ordered an evacuation of Rossmore. As I've previously reported, and I, I think I'm hoping now most people understand, Golden Rain Foundation uh, does not have the legal authority to issue an evacuation. And I know that's um, been of concern for residents who felt that Golden Rain should make those kinds of plans. Um, so to follow up on, on this initiative, the um, Golden Rain hosted a, the, the kickoff meeting with the consultant, um, and it included the Walnut Creek City Manager, the police chief, the fire chief, representatives from the city and county emergency services, the Red Cross, the city of Lafayette, a police chief, and uh, representatives from certain EPO all attended this initial kickoff meeting in April. Then uh, earlier this month, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Public Safety Manager Dennis Bell provided a tour of all nine emergency access points for the city manager, the police chief, the police captain, and the city emergency preparedness program manager. So they all, they spent about an hour and a half toured all the different locations in anticipation of uh, the city putting together an evacuation plan for Rossmore. In early June, so next week, the representatives from CERT, EPO, and the Red Cross will initiate their planning around evacuations with our consultant. And then um, uh, Council Member Wilk didn't mention, but um, I'll, I'll note that the City Council next week at their meeting um, will make, the City staff will make a presentation on the City's emergency preparedness pl plans, which <clears throat> um, City uh, of Walnut Creek does not yet have emergency plans for the rest of Walnut Creek, but they are working on plans for Rossmore. Um, so as these plans are being developed over the coming months, I want to um, encourage residents, I've put into the newspaper a number of times over the last two years, some information on putting together your own emergency go kit. Um, there's excellent resources on the internet, you can just Google them, uh, go kit, emergency pr preparedness, any of those will get you to some uh, great resources. I put in the newspaper yesterday um, a very, very lengthy, unfortunately, link to the Red Cross's site. The Red Cross has a, has a link to a document that was prepared by seniors for seniors. So it's got some things that are applicable to our community in this particular document. I'm gonna give you right now an abbreviated link 
Um, it's very brief. The one in the newspaper is very long, uh, too long. So the, the link, uh, it's a, what's called a tiny URL address. So it's, and this is the link, https colon double slash tiny URL, that's one word, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com slash Y to Y, I'm sorry, Y to V U nine H C four. So um, sorry, that's, that's even kind of long, but the one in the newspaper was crazy. I didn't realize it until I saw it in print yesterday and I thought, oh, this isn't gonna work for people. So this tiny URL will get you to the same place. So again, that's a, it's a great um, hyperlink that will take you to the Red Cross's uh, senior um, uh, emergency planning program for seniors. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is kind of related, is PG&E tree removal. Um, I've mentioned that the staff meet with PG&E several times a year. We um, talk about their infrastructure upgrades to the community. Um, I think I've mentioned here in this room before that uh, Rossmore was, was the very first community in Northern California to have underground utilities when this place was built in the early 60s. Um, so this was, that was a brand new thing. As a result, we have infrastructure now that's more than 50 years old, and that is why when you get in your little Nixle announcement on your phones or your, or your laptops, um, that there's um, pg &E, that there's an outage because pg &E is replacing the infrastructure, um, and that is what happens. They are in the process of doing that. So what we what we do when we meet with them is to periodically get updates, find out what their current status is, and then in the last two years, our emphasis has been on vegetation management. Um, the f two of the fires that occurred on uh, neighboring hillsides last year were both due to pg e equipment from animals that were electrocuted on their um, power lines, fell to the ground and ignited the brush underneath um, the lines. So um, uh, pg e notified us about 10 days ago that they're going to be removing dozens, many dozens of trees from Ross, the areas around Rossmore and in Rossmore that are underneath their power lines. So I wanted to let people know that. There are some people who are quite upset about it, but I think majority of people I think in Rossmore are mostly concerned about fire and the risk of fire, and especially pg &E's track record over the last couple of years at least has not been all that great. Um, so we are encouraging and applauding their initiative and in taking this really important step to to remove the, the risk underneath our lines that run through our valley. Um, <clears throat> I also put in the newspaper a link to, if you want to learn more about PG&E's wildfire preparation, they have extensive information that they've done and put onto their website. There's a lot of links once you get onto their website. I'm gonna provide you another link, which I put in the newspaper yesterday, which was way too long for the paper. So I'm gonna give you another tiny URL because it's the only way you can get this, and it's, and it's much shorter. It's https colon double slash tiny URL, so that's t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com slash y2gxf as in Frank, 7z as in zebra, f as in Frank. So if you click that, that will get you right to PG&E's website that will, um, and there's many, many links on their websites around um, their preparation for wildfire throughout Northern California, and then resources that consumers and their customers can do to be prepared. Um, and then there's also information on their site about their um, emergency power shutoff program. So there is a, they've, I think, sent notices to every resident and business in Northern California in the last couple of weeks advising people to be prepared because they might be shutting off the power even if there's not a localized fire because of the way these systems are set up, my understanding is that they could shut off Rossmore even though there's no risk of fire here, but there might be 25 or 50 or even 100 miles away. When they shut the power off, we're all gonna be affected by that. So um, go onto their website, 
Um, and if, if these links don't work, you can just Google pg and &E wildfire, and that will likely take you to the same place. The other thing I wanted to talk about <clears throat> was um, pool hours and a lifeguard update. Um, the good news is that we've hired a number of new lifeguards. They're in the process uh, of what we call the onboarding process that requires um, certification. They have to be certified in order to be a lifeguard. It also requires a physical exam and it requires blood tests. So all of this has to be done and in place and the test results back and they have to be certified before they can ever um, attend in guard at one of our pools here. We are, so we're cautiously optimistic that our hours are gonna be expanded soon. Recently, I think in this week's paper, maybe it was even in last week's paper, we um, did bring on some new lifeguards which did allow for an expansion on Thursdays at Hillside for some additional hours. Um, but um, this is still making a lot of people very unhappy that all of the pools are not open for all the hours that they would like at this time of the year. Um, some letter writers in the Rossmore News have alleged that the lifeguard shortage is a result of mismanagement. And I will tell you, um, although I'm, certainly I'm vested in this, um, it is not due to mismanagement. We've been aware of this for about a year. Um, the lifeguard community, not just in Rossmore, but throughout Northern California is severely impacted. There is a huge shortage of workers. And in fact, there's a shortage of workers for almost any profession anywhere right now in the Bay Area. The Bay Area is effectively at zero unemployment. Um, they say it's around one and a half or so percent, but that they say a, a fully employed economy in the Bay Area, they consider at a 4% unemployment and we're less than half of that in unemployment. So which means that anybody who's looking for a job has got a job. And so employers who are looking for employees are struggling to find people to fill positions. We have on our website a whole bunch of open positions for the Golden Rain Foundation. We're having great difficulty, not just with lifeguards, but for every available position. And we are not unique. You can look all through the want ads in the newspaper, online. There are thousands and thousands of unfilled jobs in the Bay Area. You can go down to any retail space down here in Walnut Creek and find stores, uh, uh, signs in the window of storefronts begging people to apply and we're in that exact same boat. So um, we've tried a number of different things. We have raised the, um, the rate for lifeguards. We have provided uh, financial incentives, uh, basically a sign-on bonus for people if they, once they are hired. We're trying a lot of different things. We have approached all of the high schools, all of the colleges, uh, job boards, um, swim coaches, swim schools. Um, everybody is in the same boat. We're all trying to find the scarce uh, lifeguards. And I will tell you, to be perfectly honest, it's really tough to hire what are called uh, low skill, um, low, relatively low wage positions when Uber and Lyft pay at least that amount plus, and then restaurants pay that and tips. So we don't have that here, we don't have tips. So we're competing, that's what young people generally are looking for for jobs. They can make a lot more money as a waitress or a waiter or a bartender than they can working as a lifeguard. So that is, that is the challenge. Some of the letter writers have demanded that regular swimmers should have preference over non-regular swimmers and families. And I'm sorry, but uh, that can't happen. All residents here in this community have equal, pay equally to operate those pools. Everybody has a right to use those pools, not just the regular swimmers. Um, I also wanna note that there are a minimum of two pool facilities that are open from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. Um, plus the indoor pool is open till 9 p.m. So there are two open, fully open from 6 a.m to 8 p.m. and then the indoor pool at until 9 p.m. So we just don't quite yet have the staffing to cover all three pools for those hours. But we're, uh, weekends, all, all the pools are open for all the hours. It's just during the week that's impacted right now. So we're, we're getting there it's, it's, and it will get improve as we get some more of these people hired. And I know that the board, um, I know they're concerned about this. Uh, the aquatics committee has taken some criticism around this. Um, unfairly, um, everybody is doing their best that they can under the circumstances. So I, I, I thank everybody for their patience. The Redwood Room <clears throat> residents have um, continued to ask questions about the 
Um, we finally did get the permit from the county uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, there were some modifications, some minor modifications that they are requiring before um, we, we can actually open the facility. Um, but it's, it's we're getting very close. So we would hope to be open um, within uh, early part of the summer. So um, I'm hoping a month from now we'll be reporting that the facility is open, the new cafe operator. Um, the solar farm up, on, uh, up by MOD, if you haven't seen it yet, it's, it's happening. It's there, the physical structures are up now um, on, on above the RV lot. They are, um, I was up there the other day, they were boring into the hillside, um, which is on the unimproved portion of, uh, um, away from the complex. Um, those structures are not there yet, but above the RV lots, you can now see the physical structures, they are there. Once um, that is completed above the RV lots, then the RV lot will be repaved, and then we will move the RVs back. So we still have a few more weeks, maybe a couple more months left to go on this, but it's actually exciting to finally see this happening. Um, <clears throat> I also have a message for the anonymous letter writers. I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating again. Anonymous letter writing, I, I, I'm not sure why people do that. There's very little that I or the board can do with anonymous letter writing. Usually, we have found that there's a lot of misinformation or mi um, incorrect assumptions that the letter writers are including in the anonymous letter writing. Recently, the anonymous letter writers are, have taken to writing me at my home. My wife does not appreciate that. I don't live in Rossmore. Um, my, my personal life and my work life are separate, so it's inappropriate to write me at my home. Um, <clears throat> In order for us to address your issues, you must include your name and contact information. That way we can clarify and ask questions and follow up. I can't do any of that with an anonymous letter. Those go straight into the circular file. So um, I, I don't know who those people are, but whoever you are, please discontinue doing that. It's not helpful. Um, and we want to solve your problems. Whatever your issues are, we want to fix them. Um, but I've got to know who you are, and um, because usually I need to follow up with questions around what the issues are. The last item is employee transitions. We had um, five employees begin employment with Golden Rain this uh, last month in April. Benjamin Clark, he's a range worker on the golf course. Jose Gorgonio, a, a landscape technician. Um, Samuel Richards, uh, an editorial staff writer for the Rossmore News. Francis LaFranco and Suzanne Howards, both are lifeguards with the Aquatics Department. And we unfortunately had one employee leave our employment in April. Unfortunately, it's because she passed away. Jacqueline Blau was an administrative assistant for the Rossmore News. And I know she was um, worked for the Rossmore News for a number of years. She, I know she'll be missed by the uh, residents and by the staff. And that's my report. Any questions for Tim? Thank you, Tim. Uh, I want to mention, I think, for those URLs, uh, my understanding is that the online version of the newspaper would have active links. Is that correct, Anne? Uh, OK. Sorry about that. Soon they'll have active links. Uh, now the residence forum, Barbara. Good morning. Um, please. When you come up, give your name and address. And if you have any written material, please give it to Paulette when you're done. And you have three minutes to speak. And we have three speakers this morning, and they are, I hope I get this right, Tank Aegeus. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> Suzanne Aldrich and Daryl, is it Harvey? Yes. Oh. Come up. Good morning. A few weeks ago, I advised this board of the need for an ADA-compliant restroom at Hillside. And I thank you very much for listening to my plea and seeking a solution so quickly. Item 11E on your agenda today suggests that you have found a temporary solution to discuss. On behalf of those Rossmoreans who use the facilities at Hillside and cannot currently use a restroom, I ask that you approve this agenda item 
and move ahead as soon as possible. The Activities Council, on whose board I also serve, recently paid to have a beautiful new illuminated notice board installed outside the Peacock Theatre. Now, nothing goes to waste in Rossmore, and you would kindly install the old notice board for us outside the Las Trampas room. Thank you. In the Las Trampas room, there is considerable mold in the ceiling of that room that causes breathing problems for some people, especially singers when they rehearse there. I would ask the board to please look into this health hazard. And my name is Tancred Aegis, and I live at 2740 Tarmigan Drive, number one. Thank you, Paulette. Hi, <clears throat> good morning. I'm Suzanne Aldrich, and um, instead of writing a letter, <laughs> I just wanted to come personally and thank all of you for listening to us. Many of us, so, so many, we want to keep Comcast, and I want to thank you for a lot of us. There's a lot of reasons why people like Comcast. I want to put my reason because probably nobody else has this reason. It helps me with my job. I'm a teacher, I'm still teaching, and I listen to so many channels on Comcast that I would hate to lose it. I, t I listen to history, the Spanish channel, because I teach Spanish for travelers. I listen to travel, I listen to history. I also used to be a chef, I teach cooking, so I listen to all the cooking shows. So it's very helpful to me that you kept this. So I just want to thank all of you for listening to us, and um, I think we need to thank people once in a while. Once in a while, so thank you. And I'm Suzanne Aldrich, fifteen forty nine Oakmont Drive, in Wasmore. Good morning. I'm Daryl Harvey, and I'm here with my husband, Greg. We're at 1100 Tarmigan Drive, Entry 2. We love trees and the natural beauty of Rossmore, and we'd like to comment on the issue of sequoia trees that was brought up at the past two GRF meetings by several landscape architects and GRF member Ken Anderson. There was a discussion regarding the planting of sequoias at the Hillside Pool parking lot. And as was discussed, the sequoias were planted to provide shade, but because the trees are conical in shape and don't have wide ranging branches, they have to grow very tall before they provide adequate shade. And by that time, they may be obstructing the view around them, which are our beautiful native oak woodlands here. Uh, so during the past 50 years of Rossmore, uh, the, the sequoia tree uh, may have been very popular and beautiful. And when we moved here from a mostly treeless area of Southern California, we purchased a home within 10 feet of a row of mature sequoias. Um, right now they're about 150 feet tall. And at first we really enjoyed them. And then we realized that as the irrigation was shut off, the trees became very stressed and they started dropping piles of dead branches, needles, cones, twigs. And they leave a large stack of tinder dried dead debris underneath them, uh, which in a wildfire would act just like kindling. Even though the trees themselves may be fire retardant, the dead debris beneath them would ignite immediately and many of these debris piles are very close to residents' homes. Um, the required 100 feet of defensible space mentioned in yesterday's Rossmore News sometimes does not exist because the sequoias are very tall now and planted very close to the homes. So in addition, we noticed young sequoias planted in rows along the 16th fairway of the Dollar Ranch golf course, which will grow very tall and will obstruct our view of the beautiful hillsides for which we paid a premium in purchasing our home. We also noticed a string of young sequoias planted in rows on fairways nine and 13, and as they grow to their full height, they'll obstruct the views of homes on Terra Granada and Rossmore Parkway. So in conclusion, we realize that these are golf course issues to be taken up with golf course management, but we wanted to commend Ken Anderson and the landscape architects for bringing up this in 
important topic. And in addition, we appreciate Rebecca and her staff, plus Mutual 2 Director Michael Stoddard for helping us resolve some of our ongoing landscape issues. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Aquatics Committee, Brian. Morning. Uh, also, welcome to two new board members. Appreciate your volunteerism. Um, I want to expand a little bit on what Ken said. Uh, Ken, Tim, I'm sorry, Tim. Um, about the uh, the pool schedule, uh, we expect to resume the pool schedule fully staffed at all facilities for all of our hours from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. At, at Tice Creek on Monday, June 3rd. Um, thanks to the efforts of the uh, of, of uh, Jeff's staff and the aquatics uh, staff also. Uh, they've been working really hard to try and fill these positions and get everybody happy. Um, and it's going to pay off on Monday. So looking forward to that. Um, my report, as included in your packet, is accurate and complete. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mary. Uh, Brian, I just have one question, and that is, uh, so we'll be able to attract new lifeguards, but are they going to go back to school or whatever they do in the fall, and so we're going to end up with the same issue? Well, it looks like a couple of the ones we've hired for the summer are, are, will be seasonal employees. Um, we are still looking for full-time employees. Okay. I, I may have poached a lifeguard from Emeryville last Saturday. Oh, congratulations. So we're, we're hoping, and he would probably be a full-time person also. So uh, Good. Yeah, we're, we're working. We're beating the bushes for lifeguards, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll pay off in the fall as well. Good. Thanks. Great. Other questions for Brian? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, finance, Bill. Good morning. The regular monthly meeting of the GRF Finance Committee was held last Tuesday. I announced that the three-year terms for two members of the committee are ending next month and that we are encouraging any residents interested in applying for membership in the GRF Finance Committee to submit their application to Paulette Jones by June the 7th. We will have recommendations for the board approval of membership positions by the next GRF board meeting. After discussion, the committee recommends that the board move forward in pursuing the Innovati proposal for four energy efficient projects subject to PG&E's project approval. The committee also reviewed the current reports to update the trust estate revenue projections to reflect current conditions and to consider it any additional detail. Our monthly monitoring will culminate in a revised recommendation at our June 25th meeting as to the trust estate funding levels available for the rest of 2019 and moving forward into 2020. Any questions? No, uh, I guess not. Thank you. Thank you. Now, golf, uh, John. Good morning, and on behalf of the Golf Advisory Committee, I'd like to welcome the new directors to the seats. Um, I thought I would take um, a moment and give you just a little overview of what our committee does for you without taking too much time. Uh, the advisory committee meets uh, monthly. It includes the director of golf, the superintendent of golf, uh, uh, the director is Mark uh, Heptic, and the superintendent is Blake Swint. There are voting members uh, on the board. There's three appointments from the Golden Rain Foundation board uh, and a representative from each of the four golf clubs, the Ross Mar Men's Golf Club, the Women's 18-Hole Golf Club, the Women's 9-Hole Golf Club, and the Mixed Group Hackers. Uh, the report that you get from our committee includes uh, financials, which are the number of rounds played uh, for the month and uh, cumulatively for the year. Uh, the fees charged to the golfers, sales of merchandise in the pro shop, uh, golf lessons, driving range receipts, um, and uh, we report and, and oversee the playing conditions, the health of the golf course, the safety issues on the golf course, 
and we would invite any of the uh, members of the board who would like to take a golf cart ride and review the golf course and the infrastructure that that's always available to you. So other than that, the report from the Golf Advisory Committee is in your packet. So that's all I have. Questions for John? I have a couple. Okay. Um, I'm not sure you'll be able to answer them, but I noticed uh, the, in the report that the uh, non-glyphosate uh, applications are going down on the uh, mulched areas. Does that mean that there will be future applications of glyphosate on those, the Roundup on those, or have they switched to non-Roundup? Um, actually, I'm not prepared to answer that. But, okay, uh, sorry. Um, another question. We can get that for you, though, from Blake. Yeah, I, I'd like to know next month what uh, if they're going to switch from Roundup or if this is a, an addition to Roundup. Okay. I know residents were concerned about that. Also, I noticed that they were going to raise the mower height one quarter of an inch. Now, that was that a joke? I mean, is that really significant? <laughs> I have a hard time believing that that makes a big difference. It's, it's a game of inches and quarter inches. Um, there's, there's two things that are involved. One is it does make for a better playing surface, but two, it also can contribute to the health of the grass on the golf course, depending upon its moisture retention, it goes a little bit by height. And uh, Blake is a remarkable uh, superintendent and that's the level that he goes to to make those measurements. I mean, he can tell you how much water we use on the golf course for every sprinkler head on his magic um, iPad, he has, there must be 3,000 or more sprinkler heads in the golf course, and he can identify each and every one when they went on, how much water they put out, um, and uh, can adjust them if he has to. So it's, it's a really remarkable. So that's on the fairway, not the green, right? A quarter inch higher yeah, grass it's on, the, on fairway. the fairway. I'm sorry, right. so, fairway, yeah. yeah. So, well, I, I was thinking that if, if it does retain moisture better, then maybe we should just raise it everywhere. But it sounds like he's, he's got it all under control and knows what he's going to, you, what needs to be done where. Because it was only in one fairway that they were talking about doing this. And I just thought that was amazing. You, it, it is. And I would just tell you that you would not want to ask Blake to explain it to you. Okay. Because, <laughs> but he knows. Okay. Okay, I'll take your word. And the last thing is, I just want to ask you guys to take care of Ken. He's not a golfer. He's, was assigned, he thought it was a mistake when I assigned him to the golf committee, but I, I thought that he could learn a lot from you guys, but you have to take care of him now and, and teach him the game of golf, at least uh, theoretically, okay? Well, well welcome. <laughs> and if you think uh, that uh, you're not good enough to play golf, I invite you to just sit on the porch outside of the um, pro shop and watch the first tee box, and you'll take it up, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, now board committee reports. The first one is compensation. That's Mary. Thank you, Bob. So we have a motion that I will make at the end of a little bit of background information. So uh, today the committee is ready to make a recommendation to the board regarding the 2020 base wage pool. In the next couple of months, the committee will also have recommendations on the 2020 market adjustment pool and a benefits package. <clears throat> Making these compensation decisions seven months before they are implemented is difficult but necessary, as you all know. Um, it's all driven by the uh, timing of the GRF budget cycle. So we have to get our numbers into the budget early, and then we have to be able to um, assess what we do and figure out what needs to change. So on that note, uh, before making today's recommendation, the committee weighed many factors before arriving at the base wage pool recommendation. We reviewed Bureau of Labor statistics like the Employment Cost Index and the Urban Consumer Price Index. And using new developed reports, we assessed the effectiveness of the 2019 program. We also considered the number of currently open GRF positions and the length of time required to fill open positions, as well as the general employment climate in the Bay Area. And Tim did a good job of uh, talking about uh, how difficult it is to get employees. And we can't run a business if we can't get employees. So that was some of the thinking of the comp committee. So now I'll make a motion. Um, 
that the committee recommended and uh, hopefully someone will second it and then we can discuss the details. So I move that the board approve a 2020 budget principle adopting a base wage pool for non-represented employees at 4% of current wages. Carl seconded. Any discussion? Questions, discussion of it? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, passes. Was there another comment you were gonna? No, that oh, was it. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> sorry about that, okay, good. Uh, planning, less. The planning committee is still involved in reviewing the tech committee's uh, proposals and uh, hopefully we will have something for the board for the next month. Any questions for Les? Okay, thank you. We have no unfinished business. Now we're going to new business. Um, this is the approval uh, of the board committee appointments, one year terms effective immediately. Um, so this would be uh, to read them. I guess I'd like to hear a motion that uh, would actually um, read the names of the people in the committees that they're going to be on. So would someone, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> we need a motion to approve effective immediately the following uh, committee appointments. The Aquatics Advisory Committee, Sue DiMaggio Adams. The Audit Committee, Mary Neff. The Finance Committee, Mary Neff. The Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Les Birdsall. The Golf Advisory Committee, Ken Anderson. And uh, while we're at it, we'll just include, um, well, no, we'll do a separate one on that. So that, can I hear a, mo uh, a second for that motion, please? Second. Okay, Ken, I think, got second on that. So any complaints? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? No. Okay, thank you. Now we have the, um, uh, the board committee appointments. Uh, we have the Compensation Committee, and the board members on that are Les Birdsall, Carl Brown, Mary Neff, Kathleen Stumpfel. Mutual Liaison Committee is Barbara Coonan, Dale Harrington, Kathleen Stumpfel, and myself. Planning Committee, Ken Anderson, Les Birdsall, Carl Brown, Mary Neff. The Policy Committee, Ken Anderson, Barbara Coonan, Dale Harrington, and myself. And we have the Ad Hoc TV Internet Survey Task Force. The board members on that are Carl Brown and myself. Uh, can I have a second to that motion, Carl? Oh, okay, any discussion, questions? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, and the chair people for those committees are compensation is Mary. The policy committee is Ken, and the planning committee is Carl. So now we have the uh, appointment of the uh, resident members of the ad hoc uh, TV internet survey task force. Um, we have uh, selected Adrian Byram, Howard Lowe, Ray Miller and Peter Squire. Um, the, uh, their resumes were attached in the packet. Uh, can I have a second to a motion to approve them? Okay, Ken. Any questions, discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, effective immediately. Uh, those people are members of the ad hoc TV internet survey task force. Um, thank you for applying and uh, be willing and willing to serve on that. We will have the residents, uh, committee members, uh, appointments for the new term uh, next month for the uh, other advisory committees. So now we have a <clears throat> we need a motion for adopting a Mechanics Bank 
uh, resolution authorizing GRF board officers, the CEO and the CFO to sign and act on behalf of the organization. Can I hear a motion? So move. So move. <laughs> okay. Uh, a second. I second it. Mary is second. Any discussion questions about this? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Now we're gonna get to a discussion of the Innovity project. I'm sure this is be interesting. Jeff, thank you. Okay, good morning. Back in December, the board approved uh, an agreement with Innovity to conduct some investigation into energy efficient projects for Golden Rain Foundation. And the concept was to identify projects that would meet the qualifications for financing under the pg es on-bill financing program. That program is a 0% interest loan that is uh, from the Public uh, Utilities Commission, the, of an assessment that's on everybody's utility bill that goes into uh, a pool uh, that could be used for these types of programs. I was asked the other day if, if that uh, pot of money may be in jeopardy because of PG&E's uh, bankruptcy and financial status, and that, and that is not the case. Over the past several months, Innovity has been doing some investigation. They've researched our, our reviewed our utility bills, our infrastructure as far as our lighting, interior, exterior, our HVAC systems at the various clubhouses, our pool pumps, our uh, various uh, energy consuming uh, infrastructure. And they have identified four projects that they believe will uh, meet the qualifications for the pg e program. Those include converting the exterior street lights to LED, uh, converting all parking lot lights and any other exterior lighting to LED, converting interior lights all to LED. Uh, we do have one clubhouse, the, the new fitness center that has already been converted, but all the other ones would be upgraded to LED lighting. And then the HVAC system up at MOD uh, would be uh, updated, as well as the HVAC system at Hillside Clubhouse. Together, those projects have a 9.2 year payback estimate, uh, and that meets the qualifications of a maximum of 10 years. The program next needs to be submitted to PG&E for their review of Innovity's calculations. Uh, they need to approve that uh, to qualify us for the, the funding. Once that is done, we would have a final contract with Innovity based on final bids that they received from contractors to complete the work. And once that is done, PG&E then funds the project directly to Innovity and Golden Rain Foundation would make monthly payments directly to PG&E on our utility bill. The payment is not to exceed what the estimated savings would be from those various uh, energy saving measures. So at this point uh, in your packet, there is uh, the estimate of savings, the, uh, the cost estimate. Uh, we're asking you to approve and authorize the CEO to execute the on-bill financing agreement as well as the agreement with Innovity as long as it is approved by PG&E and the uh, contract prices come back substantially consistent with what's being submitted. I want to point out that this is an incredible deal for Rossmore. The total value of these improvements is over a million dollars and that it will cost us nothing up front. So we're getting, a, as, as Jeff said, an interest-free loan for over a million dollars to make these improvements. And the improvements are uh, expected to save us $11,000 a month on our PG&E bill or energy bill, which will go to pay for this over the first nine or 10 years, but after that, we will be saving the $11,000 a month on that. So um, can I hear a motion to approve this? To make it here. Uh, I move that the board authorize the CEO to execute the implementation agreement with Innovity and the on-bill financing agreement with PG&E based on the final firm price proposal being substantially consistent with the budgetary estimates included in the report. Second. Second. 
So. Okay, Sue has seconded. Now discussion, questions, Carl and then Ken. Yes, the task force that did originally started this project, and I know I've specified this, but there are safety concerns about residents with using lighting above 3,000 Kelvin. All of the lighting in this project is 4,000 Kelvin. Um, was Innovity asked, I, I know I specifically asked you for estimates on 3,000 or less Kelvin, uh, and I don't understand why there, that's not in this proposal. So I'd, I'd need to go back to Innovity and ask them for their analysis of 3,000 compared to 4,000. That's in Yeah, there. because, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a number of reports in the tech committee looked at it, and uh, for seniors, they recommend below 3,000. I know it may affect the uh, bottom line also financially, so it's just not going to be an easy solution, and it looks like at least the Cobra lights, the elements are built into them. It's not a bulb you can change later. And I hate to make a million-dollar mistake. <clears throat> So you'll get that information to us? I'll get back to you. Thank you. Uh, Ken? I had the same question. Also two more. Is replacement of the HVAC uh, systems at MOD and Hillside, could that interfere with any major alteration down the road? Well, it, it I don't know that it would interfere. You might consider what you do is, is uh, take that into consideration as in a future design of anything. Um, but they are both units are in need of replacement and were discussed earlier this year on your uh, capital project list and deferred for another year. So this is the way of accomplishing what needs to be done maintenance wise. And I wouldn't suspect you're going to have any major renovation for either of those facilities within the next 10 years. <clears throat> the other point I had was that uh, looking at the uh, attachments and supplemental materials provided by Innoviti, um, at first I was very, very impressed, and then the more I looked at it, the more confused I got, and then the more suspicious I got. Uh, the, the Kelvin rating was one of the items, too. But I was also wondering about the, the cost. For example, uh, they want to replace um, uh, 293 of the street lights at $843 a piece. That seems a, like an awful lot of money, considering that I think six months ago we were given the uh, much, much lower cost for an LED equipped Cobra light. Um, also, while on the, on the same subject, and also they want to charge uh, $99 for one outdoor PAR 38 13 watt spotlight. That, that seems incredibly expensive. I'm not sure about street lights, but that seems awfully expensive for a par light. Um, also, uh, even more exorbitant, I think, unless they're, they're including labor or something, was that they, they, they want $99 for one four foot 18 watt lamp strip. I'm sorry, for $230. And they wanted 438 of those. $230 for a one four-foot strip light? That's, that just sounds outrageous to me. But is there something magical about these strip lights? So all of these prices, they will receive competitive bids for. We want to make sure that the specified lighting is of high quality and has the uh, warranties associated with it. We've, we have actually done some programs before, uh, many years ago, and ended up with poor quality lighting. So we want to make sure that everything we get is, is high quality. Uh, and backed up by warranties. So these will be competitively bid. These are estimates at this point, uh, and we will get to see those those competitive bids. Will we get a chance to look at those uh, ref ref refined uh, prices? 
So what we're asking is that you approve this as long as the, the costs are substantially consistent with, with this. If there's anything higher, we would bring it back to you. Uh, we can alert you what the final price is, certainly. Uh, but if you want us to bring it back, then you would just have to do this. But you guys are going to be on top of this, right? Yep. Okay, thank you. Other questions on this project? So did that include, do those prices include labor? Do you yes, know? Yes, this, this is installed prices. Okay, so that, that's what makes a big difference, obviously, to remove the old and install the new is going to add quite a bit. Dale. So I would assume that the prices they included would be their thought of the possible maximum that might be charged for those. That's correct, and, and we are doing a few uh, unique things. Up at uh, Las Trompas Room, there's some redesign of the lighting up there. Uh, we have some additional lighting being added to some dark spots in the parking lot. So all of it's not a direct one-for-one -one replacement. Um, so that, that adds some cost to Any other questions? Carl. Yes, I noticed you made some also put in some additional light where it's appropriate. I mentioned three street lights last time. I've gone over, looked at them. 136 looks like it's absolutely no problem as far as getting in. 135 is facing away and well below, and 134 is certainly below, and with the additional shading it's, and the fact that uh, we're going from 6,300 lumens to uh, 5,200 or less, it would seem like uh, the spill, light spillage should not be a problem even if we go 20% more on the, uh, or so on those lights, because that is a dark area, and with all the animals crossing there, you know, it's something I'd also like to see consider. The uh, consultant with Anobody did look at those three lights in, in particular and, and agreed those could be a higher, so. Other questions, Kathleen? And just sort of for the record, what would be the installation schedule for the streetlights? I don't have a schedule uh, currently. It all depends on the approval process with PG&E, but hopefully over the next, uh, once this is submitted, it's a, probably about a six-week program with PG&E, and then we can uh, get it scheduled. So hopefully by early fall. Any other? Carl. Since we're looking at approval, I would like to make an amendment to the motion that the lights do not exceed 3,000 Kelvin. Okay, is there a second to Carl's amendment? I'll second it. Okay, discussion on the amendment now. Mary. I'm hesitant, Carl, to um, make that motion now and to uh, lock us into that uh, restriction without some further uh, consulting with some experts. I, Ken? I, I would also like to know the practical significant differences between a 2,700, a 3,000, and a 4,000. I'd like to some measurement about how much difference there is between those. Less. Uh, I agree with Mary. This has been presented by the consultant who are professionals in this field. And uh, I hate to change it from 4,000 to 3,000 not knowing anything about it or what I'm doing. So I can't support Carl's motion. Other discussion about this amendment? Kathleen. Uh, can the amendment be put in as a possible um, 3,000 instead of 4,000, um, depending on the recommendation of the experts? Well, I, I think 
probably either we're going to require it or they've said, uh, Jeff has said that he would follow up on this. Um, so I don't, I think it'd be better to not, I mean, either we, we would require it in, in the amendment or not would be my guess on. So I, I think that we should trust that Jeff will follow up on it. I mean, I know there's a big difference. I just, over the last weekend, had to get, climb up a 20-foot ladder to replace a, a 5,000 Kelvin LED that I had installed uh, after my wife said that color is terrible, I can't have that. So, so I know that's 5,000 was, was, was bad and I had to put in 3,000 in, but I don't know the difference between a 3,000 and 4,000. So um, I'm, I guess I'm hoping that the, uh, I, I do know that Carl is correct that the, uh, the recommendation of the ad hoc tech committee was 3,000. So I'm, I'm conflicted myself. So other discussion anyway, Carl. Yes, from what I read, and you know, I am not an expert in this, that 5,000 is really bad for just about everybody, and it is essentially a blue LED with yellow phosphor to bring the, the, the thing down, but the problem is the blue lights, like UV rays, are damaging on eyes. Now, uh, that's 4, to correct, 000, just, yeah, oh, so 4,000. 4,000 is determined fine for young eyes. Their recommendation from most studies is that for older people, uh, they recommend that they see better with the warm white light, the 3000 Kelvin actually improves visibility. So for things like street lights, et cetera, it would improve safety and uh, I'm just passing on, and the tech committee did a serious study into this, so. So do you remember any discussion with Inovity about this difference between 3,000 and 4,000? I, I do not. I know we have some test ones out, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what the, that is without going and, and confirming. So I, I'll, I'll get back to the, the board on what nobody has to say as far as price impact and, and so forth. And, and so all we're doing is authorizing uh, Tim to sign this agreement. So if we could have a, uh, an understanding that uh, you'll get back to us, let's not hold up the, uh, the, the approval for signing, but let's have you get back to the board with uh, information about this and then maybe we'll informally discuss, but we do have a motion on the floor to amend it to require 3,000 uh, Kelvin. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I just want to reiterate to what I and Les has said about Kelvin. I do not want to move forward on this until we know the difference between a 4,000 and a 3,000, because that be a, could be a critical decision, and we might come to regret it if we put in 4,000, but we don't know the difference between that and 3,000 and 2,700. So I personally don't want this to go forward until we know the answer to this question. Thank you. Carl? Yes, the other thing about 4,000 Kelvin is a popular light because it is, from what I understand, it is a lower wattage white than the same lumens in a 3,000. So, you know, it'll affect the finances of this as well. And we may have to make some hard decisions. I don't know. And I'm not in a position to make any guesstimates on this. Okay, any other discussion on the amendment? Okay, so all in favor of amending the motion to include a requirement that the, uh, now was your uh, intention that all LEDs or just the street lights? All LEDs. All LEDs be 3000 Kelvin. Uh, all in favor of that amendment say aye. Raise your hand. Okay, one vote, no need to call for, I guess all opposed? Okay, motion fail, uh, amendment, motion for the amendment fails. Now to the uh, original motion, uh, any further discussion on that? With the understanding that we will get a report about this, uh, explaining that and what, what the samples are now that are out there. All in favor say aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Carl? Uh, abstentions? None? Okay. Motion passes. <laughs> you know why I always look at you for abstention. Okay. Now, Jeff, uh, you have the uh, informational report on the hillside bathroom. So we have two items here. One is just to give you a little bit of an update on the uh, accessible accessibility or lack of accessibility for the restrooms up at Hillside. And then the, the second one is for you to consider approval of uh, a porta potty that, that is accessible along with a hand wash sink that would be placed up at the uh, clubhouse at a rental rate of about 275 per month. We have received some concerns, as was mentioned earlier uh, by the resident in, during the residents forum regarding lack of accessible restrooms or facilities up at Hillside Clubhouse. Uh, the clubhouse was built in 1968. At that time, it was built to the code. Uh, codes have drastically changed, especially in regards to accessibility. There are currently no accessible restrooms up at Hillside. Uh, there are restrooms between the Las Trompas room and the Vista room that are accessed from the exterior of the, the building, and then the ones located at the entry to the Diablo room. Uh, and again, none of them have accessible facilities. Based on the current code, if you do not do any renovations or updates, uh, you don't need to uh, go back and meet the current codes. You are only required to do so once you do a major renovation or you do improvements that require building permit. You have to do a percentage of improvements. If you do improvements to the restrooms, then you need to bring them up to code. But if you do improvements to the uh, facility, the clubhouse that requires a building permit, a percentage based on how much the value of those improvements are needs to or require some uh, accessibility improvements. There has virtually been little to no improvements over the course of the, other than cosmetics, to the Hillside Clubhouse uh, that have required uh, bringing those restrooms up to current code. We have had what is called a, a CASP, a Certified Access Specialist report done on the Dollar Clubhouse before. And based on that study, they determined that uh, our facilities, Rossmore is a private community, so we're not re required to meet the current code uh, unless we do those improvements. So based on that uh, assumption, we don't have to legally do something until uh, we actually want to make improvements to the clubhouse. That being said, this being a senior community and uh, providing accessibility is very important. Uh, we did have a architect take a look at those restrooms and what would be necessary to maintain the current count and provide all of the required accessible uh, upgrades. <laughs> And the cost uh, to do the plans, uh, get them permitted and ready for bid, is uh, about 10,600 was an estimate from an architect. And then uh, figure permitting of those plans would be about five to $10,000. Uh, they did also have a, a uh, contractor take a look at some preliminary uh, sketches and their cost estimate to actually make the improvements was uh, around $150,000 to $200,000. So overall, to make improvements to the two restrooms uh, at the entry of Diablo and the exterior restrooms, the estimate is about $150,000 to $250,000 for the full project. Uh, we will bring that back to you as part of your list of projects for consideration uh, in July when you uh, consider the uh, capital project uh, additional list. In the meantime, since there are no uh, current facilities, uh, the one option is to uh, put a uh, accessible porta potty at the facility along with a hand wash sink. This would at least provide a resource. Uh, this is not a long-term solution and would not be viewed as uh, providing an equivalent uh, alternative, uh, which is uh, one of the requirements under the accessibility laws. So it would be something you would do as you're pursuing your project as a, an option, but not a long-term solution. 
So if you wanted to implement that, the cost is, uh, again, 275 a month. So questions for Jeff. Ken? Yeah, you say this is not to be considered a long-term, but a short-term project. Uh, what do you mean by short-term? Was six to set 12 months that the whole process would take? Could that be what you consider short-term? Yeah, it, if you intend to pursue a project, then providing a port potty would be uh, appropriate during the duration of that project from you know, whenever it starts to completion. Uh, if you were not considering doing a, a project, this wouldn't be viewed as a equivalent alternative. Is there any way we could see what these porta potties would look like? Because the image I get from all the ones I've seen is, is not very good. Uh, no, they're not attractive. They're, uh, they were outside uh, when we were redoing the dollar restrooms that uh, got damaged by the tree. Uh, you're, they're your, your typical uh, blue porta potty. They're just sized appropriate and have the hand wash sink uh, with it. Mary? So I, I was at the Finance Committee Tuesday, and the good news was our membership transfer fee revenue has gone up. Um, but the bad news is the cash balance in the trust fund at the end of 2020, based on our projects, uh, is only about $320,000. It's not enough. So. If we are going to put this uh, ADA compliant bathroom on our short term list, we are going to have to not do some other things. We have almost $600,000 of projects that we deferred in February, remember? We cut it off and we said we'll come back in July and we'll see how much money we have. All those projects are waiting there. Uh, we'll add this one and I would go with the $250,000 estimate. Um, and then we have placeholders for water reclamation, creek restoration, and the gateway studios. So if, if we're going to, and the technology projects as well, I don't think that's a lot of money, but they're there. So I'm, I'm only bringing this up because if, if we're going to say that this uh, ADA compliant uh, remodeled bathrooms are on that short term list, then we're going to have to take off some things. I don't think we can even afford to do all the projects that we have uh, uh, that are, amount to about 600000 So several of you were at the Finance Committee meeting. You heard the uh, discussion. We talked about what is the ending cash balance that we'd like to see in the trust fund every year. We have about $2 million worth of debt every year that we have to pay. So the number is 2 to $2.5 million. So the message is... We'll just have to do some priority setting. We know how to do that, but be thinking about that. Kathleen? So my question is the porta potty, would it be outside so that people would have to go outside to go to the porta potty? Yes. Les? Since we are short of money for additional projects, did I understand you to say that if we approve the porta potties, we're essentially saying that we are going to remodel Hillside well, for, the I bat for the bathrooms? What I would say is that, uh, as I just mentioned, a porta potty would be outside, likely in one of the, the first stalls and, or, or behind the, the clubhouse if it could fit there. That means that a person would have to go outside, go to that. An able-bodied person could go directly into the restroom there. It's not an equivalent alternative. So in a short term, it's better than not having anything there. But in the long term, that's not a solution to accessible restrooms at, at the clubhouse. So I'm not. it's up to you what you want to do. Uh, I'm just saying that it wouldn't be viewed as an a acceptable alternative long term. Jeff, can you remind me? I'm, unfortunately, my brain is not clear on this point. So, part of the Innovity project is replacing the air conditioners at MOD and Hillside. Were those on the original capital list that we approved? Either one of those? 
They were not. We didn't bring them to you. We deferred them till next year, but they are both in need okay. of. Okay. Darn, can't solve that that way. Other questions for Jeff? Dale. I don't have a question, uh, Jeff, and I know you would agree with this. As you said, there are some things that are not required, and there are some things that are required. Um, things that are not required, obviously, we can let go. But even though this is not required, I totally support us doing something for the people. Carl? Yes, I think that we need to provide something. It may not be the best solution for people that may need wheelchair access, which the current bathrooms don't. So, and it's something that we can always change our mind about later. And I agree with Mary, we're really tight on our capital budget. Mary? I, um, I want to make it clear that, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to doing this at all. And by this, I mean remodeling the bathrooms. But I recognize, because I look at those numbers all the time, that some very important projects are not going to be able to be done. And so we are going to have uh, some people in this community disappointed because they thought we were considering those projects and we're saying, no, something more important now has come up. So that's the decision this board's going to be faced with probably next month or the month after. So I, I, uh, it, it's a, I guess that's why they pay us the big bucks. But uh. Sue? Jim, we're talking about two, bath two units, one inside the Diablo room and one outside that primarily the people in the, the <coughs> lawn bowling use, correct? Is there one also in the lawn bowling thing? There is not. So we're only talking about those two facilities. Correct. So people that are not in the Diablo room have to go out either outside or over to the Diablo room at any rate, right? Okay, Correct. I just we're just talking about two. Les? I'm I just want to make sure that if we approve these bathrooms that are temporary that the residents residents don't get the idea that we are going to remodel the bathrooms within Hillside because we don't have the $250,000 at this time unless we postpone some of the things that we've already approved or considering. So uh, this would have to be a temporary solution, but this temporary solution could end up going four, five, six, seven, eight years. Well, I think what Jeff is saying is we can't do, we don't want to do that because then we're opening ourselves up to a lawsuit basically that they're not comparable, so we can't do that. So in a way, if we vote to approve the, uh, the porta potties, that we're almost committing in a, to approving the remodel. So it's a difficult situation because all of us here I think are sh we're shocked to hear that there were not accessible bathrooms up there. I know I was. I, I was completely surprised that we could go this long without an accessible bathroom. However, uh, we are sort of in a quandary here. Uh, obviously, we want, it, we want to have accessible bathrooms, but if we approve these portable bathrooms, what Jeff is saying is that we should not intend those to be a permanent long-term solution which almost means that we then will have to move up on the list come July, the approval of the remodeling of those bathrooms. So right now we, we don't even have a motion on the floor, but we're just getting, gathering information. So are there other questions and comments? Mary. I just have a thought. Um, so we have a list of about $600,000 worth of projects. I don't have it here. Um, if we were to defer this decision for one month, at the planning committee that's coming up, we could uh, look at the deferred projects and we could figure out what we're going, you know, what, what's coming off so that this can go on or we could decide we don't want to redo the bathrooms, everything else is more important. Um, but then, then we, next month we could decide whether or not to put in the porta potties. I, I just want to make sure that we're understanding the long-term consequences of uh, 
putting this project on our list. Other things will have to come off. Kathleen? Um, uh, one question, uh, I, I guess I'm not familiar with Hillside enough. Um, is it possible to do one of the bathrooms and not the other? Can the people who uh, need to use the one that's been remodeled, like in the Diablo room, and, and not the other one? Like Would that? Yeah, like yeah. a unisex bathroom, or is, is there another alternative that would be less money? I think uh, it, if you took on one, just doing one of the sets of, of restrooms, you're most likely would be re required to do both by the, the building code. I, I don't know that for sure, uh, but likely you would need to bring both up just because of the, the counts at the facility. You have to have so many uh, accessible toilets, urinals, sinks, and right now even access into any of the restrooms isn't uh, per code. So there's significant work to be done, uh, and I, I don't know that you can eliminate doing one of the sets to do the other. I'd, I'd have to get more information on that. Dale. This is of high enough importance to me that it's irrelevant, almost irrelevant to me, what we might have to defer down the line. I'm in favor of us making this vote now. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments about this? So what I need is, uh, will someone make a motion to approve the um, uh, placement of uh, ADA accessible porta potty at Hillside. Are you going to make that, Carl? No. <laughs> okay. I would like to move that we mo that we forward this question to the planning committee and get more details and alternatives spelled out for the board to make a better decision on this. Okay. So we have a motion. Now to forward this to the planning committee. Is there a second for that? Okay, Ken is seconded. Any discussion of that? Ken. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions, that, unanswered questions we don't know now. And uh, no, we'll just need to defer this whole thing. Okay, any other comments or questions? So the process would be that this would go to the planning committee for their June meeting. And I assume that at the same time, the finance committee would add this into the discussion. I'm hoping to give us a better idea of what projects might fall off and better clarification of. Right, so I see Bill Dorbin is still here, the finance chair. And I, I, th I think this is the time when the planning committee and the finance committee need to come together and give some alternatives. Okay, any other discussion of the motion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Dale opposed? Okay, uh, motion passes. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Now we have one more that's yours. Uh, grant application for accessible vans to be used for the on-demand transit service. So over our history, we have applied for FTA Section 5310 funding. Uh, that's federal funding for the purchase of all of our buses. Uh, currently, our buses are type two cutaways with uh, about a 14 to 16 passenger capacity. They all have wheelchair lifts. Uh, in doing the on-demand and in our paratransit service, most of the time, we have uh, only a few passengers on. On demand is, is designed to go point to point uh, rather than on a loop where you're picking up people at each stop. We uh, believe that a smaller capacity bus would be much more efficient, be easier to get in and out of the entries to provide that paratransit and door to door service. The uh, FTA has announced a, a new grant cycle uh, the grant cycles take, as you know from our last experience, they can take about 18 months to actually, from the time you get approval to when you actually get the, the vehicles. So we want to get in queue as, as early as possible. 
this would be to submit a grant for two uh, um, mini buses. They would have a maximum capacity of six passengers. They would be uh, accessible, uh, have a lift, um, and we would submit to the application uh, by July of this year. So we're asking uh, part of the grant requirements is a resolution that you need to adopt authorizing the CEO to sign all the documents uh, required for the grant. Can I have a motion to approve this? I move that we provide the resolution, approve the resolution authorizing the filing of a grant application for FTA section 5310, funding for the purchase of accessible vans to be used for the on-demand transit service. Second. Sue is seconded. Uh, questions, discussion, Mary. So um, I think Jeff, the uh, estimate is it, it could be a matching grant, about $136,000 out of the trust estate fund, and the proposal that you're making says we go for the grant now, and then we budget in the capital budget if we have to do a match. Correct. The match is a 20% local match. Uh, in the past, we've been able to use uh, bridge toll funds for uh, local matches in in, in uh, Contra Costa <laughs> County. I'm not sure we'll be able to do that again. So if, if not, then it would be a, a trust uh, expense, probably about $24,000, I think. Oh, 24, not 136. No, the total project is about 140, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, I have a question, it's not totally related to this resolution, but I'm curious. So with the uh, app for the on-demand bus service, is there a way to somehow indicate when you use that app that you need a paratransit service or some sort of accessible bus? There, there is and there will be. Uh, we're we're going to be transitioning to a, a different software program, as we discussed with you uh, a couple months back, <coughs> and that'll be part of it. You, you'll be identified, uh, the passenger, you have to qualify for the paratransit service initially. Once you're qualified, you're, you're on a list, your name would automatically alert the oh, okay. uh, system that you need that. Good. Okay. Sorry for the digression. Carl? Yes, would this in effectively be increasing our fleet and would we need more drivers? It would not increase our fleet. Uh, we have two buses currently that are ready for replacement, so this would be replacing two uh, and it would not increase our, our staffing or, or capacity. Kathleen. How does this fit into the transition that we're making to the more uh, possible on-demand in general? I mean, would these be used by people who didn't need the paratransit when it wasn't called for by? Correct. It would be used for our on-demand that could serve both uh, able-bodied and, and our uh, paratransit riders. So has the... Um, um, has it been looked at that it has less capacity um, and maybe that's a good thing? Um, has that been thought of or looked at? Correct. That's why we want to go for the uh, smaller buses with the, the, the smaller capacity so that we can easier and more fuel efficient, enter the, the entries easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, we still have the flex routes that we, we do, the four plus the downtown line, and those require a little bit bigger capacity, but the on-demand where it's more point-to-point -point, or the paratransit where you're dealing with more individualized service, we feel these buses that we're, we're applying for would be a much better fit. Any other questions about this? Okay, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. That concludes our business today. There will be a board retreat on Thursday, June 6th at 8.45 a.m. in the fairway room at Creekside Complex. It is not open to the public. There will not be a mid-month regular meeting of the board in June. The next end of the month regular meeting will be held on Thursday, uh, June 27th, 9 a.m. here in Peacock. We have an executive session, so we're recessed to that. Thank you.